Good evening, everyone. My name is Lance Cleghorn. For our CCMP route presentation, I have chosen to present on Open Shortest Path First, Version 3. I will begin the presentation by covering some of the similarities and differences between OSPF Version 3 and Version 2. Then, I will do a brief demonstration of the configuration steps regarding OSPF Version 3. As an introduction to the topic, I'd like to begin by reviewing some of the OSPF basics. In OSPF, routers are identified by their router ID. A router ID is either determined by the highest up-up loopback interface or IPv4 interface, or is determined by setting the router ID explicitly. In OSPF, routers elect a designated router and a backup designated router using their router ID. Each router maintains a full topology in their link state database. Communication to other routers in an area is accomplished through multicast communication. Authentication in previous versions is accomplished by using MD5 hashing using a shared secret. I'd like to now cover the similarities that version 3 has with version 2. In OSPF version 3, router IDs are still determined through the exact same process, meaning they still use IPv4 interfaces. The highest loopback up-up is preferred first, then the highest general up-up IPv4 interface is preferred. Hellos, flooding, and aging are comparably the same. Their timers and the way their timers are defined. Area structuring remains the same. There's still is a backbone area defined as area 0 and all other areas must have an interface in area 0. Designated router and backup designated router elections still occur based on router ID. Interface cost still comes from a bandwidth calculation. These are just some overview similarities between version 2 and version 3. As was previously mentioned, one of the primary similarities between version 2 and version 3 is the use of IPv4 router IDs. Since the router ID is still an IPv4 based address, it can be configured in the following ways. The router ID can be configured with the highest loopback in an up-up state. If there is no loopback in an up-up state, or the loopback is already in use, as may be the case in a multiple OSPF environment, then the highest IPv4 address is used on an interface. If there are no up, up interfaces that can be used, the OSPF process will fail and require that you define an, a router ID manually. Elections for the DR and BDR will still use this router ID, not an IPv6 ID. Routers have to have an RID before the OSPF process will function. Now that we've looked at some of the similarities between OSPF version 2 and version 3, I'd like to take a few minutes and discuss the major differences. In OSPF version 3, all addressing and routing is done using IPv6 rather than IPv4. Version 3 was defined for IPv6 environments. Multicast addresses are now in IPv6, meaning that when routers communicate, they communicate on an IPv6 multicast address. Authentication is no longer accomplished through MD5. Authentication is now accomplished through IPv6 authentication headers. Multiple OSPF instances per interface are now allowed. Neighbors no longer have to be in the same subnet. To describe in slightly more detail the difference in multicast addressing between version 2 and version 3, I have compiled a small chart to show these exact addresses. For all OSPF routers, in version 2, the multicast subnet was used with the last octet being the number 5. In version 3, the multicast designation of FF02 is given with all zeros and a trailing 5. There is a similar case with the all designated router address. 
Also, for reference, I have included a graphic that will remind you of some times when the OSPF routers will communicate with their neighbors and with the designated and backup designated routers. To address another major difference between OSPF version 2 and OSPF version 3, let's take a look at authentication mechanisms. In OSPF version 2, MD5 ha hashing algorithm was used or a clear text authentication mechanism was used which relied on a pre-shared key. This method also required extra router configuration. In OSPF version 3, configuration is cut down and eliminated by OSPF's ability to tap into the native support for IPsec within the IPv6 protocol stack. The IPv6 protocol stack uses authentication headers to provide an authentication mechanism between two IPv6 devices. At the bottom is included a graphic which describes this process in a more technical sense. When it comes to describing the major differences between OSPF versions 2 and 3, the neighbor requirements are often a source of confusion. For this slide, I will list out the major requirements between OSPF version 2 and version 3. This list is not all inclusive, but is made to show that while there are still some similarities in forming a neighbor relationship, there are now some differences in OSPF version 3. In OSPF version 2, an interface's primary IP address must be in the same subnet as its neighbor. In OSPF version 3, no IP address needs to be in the same subnet on an interface. There must still be an IP address configured, it just doesn't have to be in the same subnet. In OSPF version 2, OSPF must not be in a passive state on the interface. This holds true in OSPF version 3 as well. In version 2, interfaces must be in the same area to form a neighbor relationship. The same is true in version 3. In version 2, neighbors have to pass an authentication if it is configured. In version 3, authentication is not included in OSPF and thus should not be a primary concern. In versions 2 and 3, the router ID must be unique to the router. Perhaps the most interesting difference between OSPF version 2 and version 3 is the addition of multiple instances per interface in OSPF version 3. In OSPF version 2, only one OSPF process per interface is allowed. Multiple instances of the OSPF process are allowed on a router, but each interface is limited to only participating in one. In OSPF version 3, multiple instances are allowed per interface and accomplished by the use of the instance ID header field. Router resources will be a primary bottleneck for this capability as resource intense, intense processes will build up as more OSPF processes are allowed. This process is usually only used when multiple OSPF domains share a common physical link. In the case where an ISP may share a router with a customer and both may be running OSPF on the router. To conclude this presentation, I'd like to now walk you through a demonstration of configuring OSPF version 3 in the topology. The topology for this demonstration will only consist of two routers connected by a single serial interface. Our first task will be to enable IPv6 on the routers. The second task will be to bring up a loopback address for both routers to establish a router ID. Our third task will be to enable the OSPF version 3 process. The fourth task will be to add the serial interface on both sides to the OSPF process. The fifth task will be to repeat these steps on R2. The sixth task will be to run show commands verifying that both instances are up and they have formed a neighbor relationship. In the seventh task, we will establish a second OSPF process and add the same serial interface to the process. This will show that mul multiple OSPF processes can be run on a single interface without there being conflict. Also in this demonstration, please note 
that the IPv6 addresses chosen for router 1 and router 2 are in different subnets. This will demonstrate that OSPF version 3 no longer relies on the subnet category to form a neighbor relationship. In this first clip, we will enable IPv6 on the router using the command IPv6 unicast routing. This enables IPv6 on the router. After enabling IPv6 on the router, we will bring up the OSPF version 3 process number 1 on the router. As you can see, the process 1 does not have a router ID since we have not configured an IPv6 address on any interface. To mitigate the issue of our OSPF process not having a router ID, we will bring up loopback1 on R1 and assign it an IP address. For demonstration purposes, we will give this loopback the IP address of 222. Now that we have assigned our loopback interface an IPv4 address, we will restart the OSPF process. As you can see, the OSPF process comes up without issue. We will confirm this by running the show IPv6 OSPF command. Not shown in explicitly in the recording, R1 serial S010 interface is configured with the IPv6 address 192.0.1. Now that we know our serial interface has an IPv6 address assigned to it, we will start the OSPF process on this interface. Now switching over to R2, we will run the show IPv6 interface brief command to show that R2 serial interface also has an IPv6 address. Finally, on R2, we will enable the OSPF process on the serial interface connected to R1. After waiting, we will see that a neighborship forms between R1 and R2. To confirm that OSPF is running on R2 and to see specifics such as the router ID, we run the do show IPv6 OSPF command. We will now begin configuring a second OSPF instance on R2, assuming that R1 already has the same configuration. As you can see, since the, OS, since the OSPF process 1 is already using our loopback ID, we must configure a new one manually. We now bring up the serial interface and assign it with a new OSPF process. And a neighborship goes down and comes back up. Now that we have configured multiple OSPF instances, we will run several show commands to show that the OSPF process is up and running. We will start by running IPv6 OSPF. We can see that there are now two instances of the OSPF version 3 processes running. We will now run show IPv6 OSPF neighbors and see there are two neighbors. Back on R1, we will run the do show IPv6 OSPF database. And we can see here that two instances are configured with different router IDs 
and we can see the information they have received and their neighborships. This concludes the demonstration portion of my presentation. Thank you for watching. Please feel free to address any questions to me now. Thank you.